Hey, do you remember the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree? And then he goes back to it and discovers that it had died. That's in Mark chapter 11. It says, on the following day when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. You know, a few years ago, the Associated Press, they did a study that reported that the production of just a hundred bushels of corn from only a one acre piece of property required four million pounds of water, 7,000 pounds of oxygen, 5,000 pounds of carbon, 160 pounds of nitrogen, 125 pounds of potassium, 75 pounds of yellow sulfur, and a lot of other elements too numerous to list. And in addition to all of that, of course, you also need rain, you also need sunshine. So how much of the corn's growth can we actually attribute to the efforts, to the works of the farmer? It was estimated that only 5% of the produce of a farm can be attributed to the work of a farmer. In other words, 5% of the food that comes to your table, 5% of it is done from people. 95% of it comes from God. Fig trees were a common source of cheap food in ancient Israel. The trees could produce two different things that you could eat. They could, you could eat the bud, and of course you could eat the fruit. Now the buds come first, and then the leaves, and finally figs. Mark says in the story that when Jesus reached the tree, he found nothing but leaves. Jesus has an expectation. He gets there, he finds nothing. The tree looks promising from a distance, but upon closer inspection, it's fruitless. Now, many readers argue that Jesus should not have even expected figs because the Bible says it was not the time for figs. But perhaps Jesus wasn't looking for figs, maybe he was looking for the buds. The fig buds were also edible, you could have used those as food, but the problem was there's nothing. There's nothing but leaves. So why does Jesus get so upset over a fig tree? Well, for one, the tree is consuming a lot of resources, and it's not giving anything back. The tree absorbs nutrients, everything it needs to produce fruit, but it has nothing but leaves. And more than likely, this particular tree wasn't going to produce fruit that year. What's the tree's purpose? What is the purpose of a fig tree? It's to produce fruit, to produce figs. So the problem is simple. The tree is not fulfilling its design. The design that God gave that tree the tree is not accomplishing its purpose. And Jesus does not just curse this tree because it has no fruit. He didn't kill a tree because he was hungry or grumpy. The tree is a symbol of another issue. Right after the story of the fig tree, Jesus goes to the temple and he sees the people there shortchanging and scamming those who have come to worship. Out of towners who had made pilgrimages to come to the temple to worship are being hornswoggled by moneylenders. And the priests who work there, who should have been looking out for the people, should have been looking out for their welfare, they don't do anything about it. So a fig tree that failed in its purpose of bearing figs is cursed by Jesus as a symbol of the destruction of the temple that had also failed to bear fruit. In the Old Testament, the fig tree represented security and life. Take, for instance, Micah 4.4, which says, But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of the hosts has spoken. And scripture will compare people to trees and to fruit on many occasions. People can become barren or fruitful. Those who are fruitful bring life to the people around them. Christians are fruitful whenever they direct somebody towards uh, you know, their life in Christ and bring them to, to God's word. God's word is called the bread of life. Consider Psalms. 
It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Same theme, okay? Godliness brings forth fruit. Ungodliness, tree withers, tree dies. Now, we know that the Jews are God's chosen people, but all through the book of Romans, uh, Paul's been making a point that just being Jewish or just relying on your heritage doesn't save you. Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that no one includes Jews. It even includes Gentiles. For a Jew to be saved, they must come to God through Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus saves. In our study of Romans, we've been uh, listening to Paul, and he's been warning his readers not to trust in lineage, not to trust in heritage in order to save them. In fact, John the Baptist uh, warned his Jewish audience against trusting in their lineage. And John says in Luke, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So even John the Baptist, right? Uses the symbol of a tree bearing fruit and just like more Romans, a warning to the Jews, do not trust in your heritage in order to save you. So what does that mean? Does this mean that there is no hope for the Jews? Paul answers that question in our new study in Romans 11. Right at the top, he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I think that's good news, right? Paul says there is still hope for the Jewish people in God's plans. Earlier in the book of Romans, chapter 4, we said, Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. So notice that Paul is taking this idea of being a child of Abraham even further than just nationality. Paul says Abraham became a father of all who had faith. In other words, to those who believed. Because Abraham believed, right? Abraham had faith. Abraham believed in God. Now, with this in mind, we'll read the rest of our chapter, starting in verse 13. I'm talking to you, Gentiles, insomuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I can be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you are cut off of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Wow, there sure is a lot of talk about trees in the Bible, <laughs> right? Well, let's look at them, okay? Let's look at the trees for a minute. Uh, this is a fig tree right here. This is a fig tree in the Middle East. And this is an olive tree. Both are symbols of 
the Jewish people, their temple, their beliefs. And so Paul has a few things to talk to us about as Gentiles and also as Christians. And first, there is a warning about the branches that are broken off. In verse 22, Paul makes a point of saying that even though we as Gentiles are now grafted into the olive tree of Abraham's tree by faith, we should not forget that the Jewish people were broken off because of their unbelief, which at first glance maybe would fill a Christian with pride. But think about it. The Jews were proud to be God's chosen people. And they were content to relax and and to judge others, to say, you know, we're right and everybody else is wrong. Or we're saved and everybody else is condemned. Or we're loved. And Paul says it's not because of their Jewishness that they were broken off. It's because of their unbelief. They bear no fruit. And Paul is now warning us as Gentiles, as believers that God will also judge us in the same way he judges Israel, according to our faith. Which isn't new. It's always been about faith. What is faith? Faith is trusting in God, right? Trusting in God's word. Look at the very first story in the Bible. What do we see? The serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. What is this story about? Temptation? Apples? Snakes? No. It's about us having faith in God's word. Faith is what the snake asks in the garden in Eden, calling into question God's character by asking Eve, did God actually say? Are Gentiles off the hook? No, we are not off the hook. Neither can we rest and think, Christians are right and everybody else is wrong. Our Protestants are right and everybody else is wrong. I'm saved because I go to church. Paul says, you can also be cut off. And he finishes by saying, don't be arrogant. Paul is being very pastoral in this moment, both to Jews and to Christians. And I believe the goal in this section is to end Gentile pride, but also to promote unity in the church. Pride is so hurtful in the church. St. Augustine said that pride was the root of all sin. It's the toddler sitting in the sandbox with all the toys who says, I want all the toys in the sandbox and I'm not going to share. And as we grow, we begin to develop more feelings of superiority. Competitiveness comes into our life. Boasting, arrogance towards other people. And eventually, we gain this desire to elevate ourselves by putting other people down. But pride's worst form comes in how Atheists relate to God. Basically by saying, I don't need you. You can't tell me what to do. Pride's desire is to take God's rightful place. Atheism says, I am, and there is no God. Or it can show up in works. Pride can show up in works, which says, I can work my way to God on my own. I can do things that are pleasing to him, and he will accept me because of what I have done. Pride creeps into idolatry. We say, I I can make God however I want, and then I can worship the God that I've made. All of that is religious pride. Jews, Gentiles. Paul says none of us are off the hook. So what can we do? How can we prepare ourselves against pride? I would say make Psalm 139 your prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievousness way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a prayer of confession. And I think the second thing we do 
as we just begin to practice humility more. Humility comes when we internalize the truth that nothing in the life of a Christian is to be about us. It's all about Christ and him. We, we cannot possibly dwell on what I want or what I think is right and be able to serve others and ask that we would bring God glory. Heart change begins to take place when we practice the principles that are found in the book of Philippians. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You want to defeat pride? Do one thing a day for, some, for, for someone that you wouldn't normally do. You know, go out of your way to help another person or give up something you want for the sake of someone else or consider the opinion of somebody else that you think is typically wrong or beneath you. There is a warning in broken branches, but there is also a blessing in the branches that are grafted in. Grafting is this art of joining two plants together. The upper part of the graft is called the scion, and that becomes the top of the plant. The lower portion is called the understock, and it becomes the root or the trunk. Who is the trunk of the tree? Who is the trunk of the passage? Abraham. Why? Because he believed by faith. And Paul says that God has taken us off as wild shoots from our original tree and grafted us into this healthy tree. You know, in reading this in Romans, I was reminded that Jesus says something very similar in John 15. Jesus says, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. So we've looked at olives and figs and now grapes. Here is a grape tree. In John 15, Jesus says there is an important link between the vine and its fruit. And I think looking at this will help us unlock our Romans chapter 11. The branches are obviously the focus of Jesus' teaching with his disciples, just like they are in Romans 11. And Jesus says to his followers, you are the branches, right? Meaning we are not the fruit. The, uh, the fruit is the end product. But, but everything is connected. Everything is a part of every other thing. The quality of the fruit depends on the branches. And the branches have to be connected to the vine. So what Jesus is describing here is the necessary relationship between him and us, a relationship focused on staying connected to him so that we can bear fruit for the entire world. How many of you have ever looked really closely at a grapevine? Well, one of the things you notice about the branches is it's very difficult to tell one from the other. All the branches, they twist and curl together to the point where you can't tell where one stops and another stops. And Jesus uses this branch symbolism to illustrate that it's not the achievement of one individual branch or one person's status that matters, which means the quality of the fruit depends solely on the connectedness of the branch to the vine. And how are we connected? By faith. <laughs> Once we understand Jesus' use of branches, we, branches, realize we need to stay effectively and fruitfully connected to Jesus. Here's a quick lesson in grapevines. There are roots to anchor the vine to the soil and serve as the conduit where nutrients and water from the soil are absorbed. And along with the trunk, the roots also serve as a storage reserve of carbohydrates, which the vine can use for energy in the winter after the leaves have fallen and are no longer conducting photosynthesis. Now the function of photosynthesis in the grapevine is to produce glucose, which can be combined with other molecules to form larger carbohydrates 
that can be used to create other structures in the vine, such as branches, energy reserves for the plant, and for fruiting grapevines. Can be concentrated in the grape berries, which contain the reproductive seeds of the vine. So when Jesus says, I am the vine, he is making it clear that nothing can anchor us but him. It is through him that we receive all our provision. So the operative word here is abide. The word is used 11 times in 11 verses. So we can see that abiding is necessary to produce fruit. We can also see that not abiding <laughs> means a branch is useless. So what does abide mean in Christ? Jesus made it a little more specific when he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. To abide in Christ means we spend time focusing on him, focusing on his word. In practical terms, it means we spend time reading and studying and meditating on his word. When God abides in you, you are abiding in Christ. George Whitfield conducted many outdoor evangelistic campaigns in the 1700s during a great period of revival called the Great Awakening, and thousands of people responded to his gospel message. And after one of his sermons, someone asked Whitfield how many people were converted. He replied, we will know in five years. In other words, the passing of time would show which decisions were superficial and which were genuine. Some would abide and others will not. Jesus tells us to abide because it is something we can do or not do. We have a part to play. In practical terms, we have a daily choice to make. Will I spend time in prayer? Will I spend time in the Bible? Will I focus on Christ? Will I spend time with other believers? If we don't abide, then we are missing the point of this entire chapter, which is to bear fruit. When we abide in Christ, we have a wonderful outcome. It's called fruit bearing. The purpose of a fig tree is to have figs. The purpose of the grapevine is to bear grapes. And more good news, fruit bearing doesn't require any efforts on our part. Fruit is the natural result of abiding. Jesus does the work. In the very first verse, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. The vine provides life and the gardener provides what is needed for a harvest. All we have to do is abide according to Jesus. And one other thing, obey. Jesus continues, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You know, this passage adds a new and exciting dimension to our connectedness with Christ. Vines and branches have an organic biological connection in which the vine does all the giving and the branch does all the receiving. But Jesus also calls us friends. Friendship is another matter. Friendship is personal. Friendship is reciprocal. So what does it mean to be Christ's friend? Well, for one, a friend has the freedom to obey willingly, gladly. Also, Jesus mentions that he wants to share his plans with his friends because friends also care about what is important to the other friend. Jesus tells his disciples that together they possessed a shared ministry and a shared destiny. That gives us every reason to abide and to obey our true friend. What does it mean to abide and to obey? Well, each one helps out with the other. The one who abides finds it easy to obey. And the obedient one is also more comfortable abiding. On the other hand, the one who fails to abide is more likely to disobey. And the one who disobeys doesn't feel comfortable abiding. Just like fruit and branches that go together, so do abiding and obeying. I think the happiest person in the world is the Christian who is abiding and obeying. 
Jesus explained this when he said, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. That's a terrific reason to abide and obey. As the vine, Jesus provides all the nourishment we need for life. As the gardener, God does all the work needed to give us fruitful lives. As branches, we are so lucky, so lucky to be grafted in. Our part is to abide and obey. And if we abide in his love, we can experience joy to the full. And if we obey him, we are his friends. We have a shared life, shared ministry. How would you describe your connection with Christ today? Jesus is the vine. Is he your vine? Are you abiding? Are you connected? Are you hanging on tight to the source of life? Are you fulfilling your purpose and allowing him to produce fruit in your life? Everything is connected. Everything is a part of every other thing. Let's pray. Lord, when the world wants to pull me in so many different directions, help me abide. When voices clamor for my attention, help me abide. When my eyes are distracted by so many visual, enticing, lights and images help me abide if i abide i can find rest if i abide i can find joy if i abide i can find peace and shalom the answer to all the busyness and worry and stress of my life is to abide in you lord may i listen May I trust your word. May I obey. May I abide. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, I want to remind you that we have two services every single Sunday. One at 9.30, we have a choir. It's going to feel like traditional church, just like the church that you grew up in. And we have a service at 11 o'clock, which is more contemporary, more casual. Come, bring your family. We've got a program for birth. Uh, children, babies, all the way through high school. Uh, we'd love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.